This episode is brought to you by The Container Store. Yo, 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 welcome to Hard Pass. I am your host, Jacques Slade. It's the show that respects this man's sneaker rotation. Automatically, those are the lawn cutting shoes, just working in the yard. Then, but not now you get into usage, daily usage, and then there's work. These are good shoes for, uh, usually for church, and those are the wedding sneakers. Does anybody ever just look at their collection and think, wow, that guy is doing it right. And here I am with dozens, if not hundreds of shoes that I will never wear and I still can't decide what I'm going to wear. No, no, just me? I don't know. Let's start with some hot takes. It's the NBA Finals as we record this and the Phoenix Suns and the Milwaukee Bucks are locked in a battle to see if the Suns and Four Guy is the modern day Nostradamus. There's plenty of storylines like Chris Paul's forever quest to win a ring. Giannis's health and free throw woes, Devin Booker and DeAndre Ayton making the leap, people learning that Chris Middleton is not Kate's brother. But the one I want to give a shout out to is Langston Galloway. The reserve guard who was known for rocking all sorts of heat in these playoffs debuted a new sneaker brand called Ethics. Good luck to him and we are always down to feature that stuff on Hard Pass and in my other channels. I'm always down to support guys who chart their own path, especially in the sneaker world. I can relate. Even if I'm not a world-class athlete who's playing in the NBA Finals. A pair of Scars Pizza Air Force Ones designed by DJ Clark Kent was sold for $120,000. The super rare pair from 2019 was a friends and family exclusive and only 48 are believed to be in existence. Damn, and it's not even an NFT. It's a real thing I can actually wear or show off in physical form. Wow, I mean, just wow. Hey. Here's a pro tip that you should apply to literally 99.9% .9 of circumstances, regardless of whatever your stance is on issues that relate to the state of our country today. If there's a truck and it's got some cool stuff inside and there's a stranger inside encouraging you to come on in, don't. It's not political. It's not picking a side. It is quite simply common sense. Unless you are a black widow and you're stuck behind a flipped over car while Taskmaster is looking for you, a truck with people you don't know telling you to come in is not advisable. Shout out to the Ever Given Containment Ship, the infamous boat that was stuck on the Suez Canal. It's finally going to exit the canal, which means we shouldn't have any more Nike Dunk delays, right? That's what was in there, right? I'm just wondering out loud here. Remaking 90 songs are apparently the new trend on the internet. First, we got All For One touting the benefits of Xbox All Access to the tune of their wedding song staple, I swear. It's over, next gen console games friends for one prize. And then we got Juvenile and Manny Fresh to bring back Back That Ass Up. Yes, it has two Zs, along with No Limits Mia X to encourage people to, well, Vax that thing up for a dating app. I, is this the first time Cash Money and No Limit have collaborated, like, ever? Girl, you look good, want you fax that thing up. You're a handsome young brother, want you fax that thing up. Hey, whatever it takes to get people to get the jab, I'm all for it. Oh, and Xbox All Access is actually not a bad deal either. Although, I would recommend people get the Series X bundle, if, you know, you can find it. Congratulations are in order for Kanye West, or whoever this guy is, I guess. Walmart has taken down all of the knockoff Yeezy foam runners from their website that were being sold by third-party sellers. It's far from the only legal dispute that Ye has with the retail giant, but at least there's progress on that front. Meanwhile, let's talk about Ye getting his mask on. Now, I don't know why Kanye has decided to get on the mask trend, which, you know, we should all still be doing at least indoors despite being vaccinated as the Delta variant becomes the dominant strain in the US. But whatever the reason, he just decided to go all the way with it. And he's been spotted rocking full blown masks that cover his entire face. Like here he is at the Balenciaga show for Paris Fashion Week, just chatting it up with Bella Hadid and F1 driver Lewis Hamilton. I'm just going to stick with my Spider-Man face mask. Thank you very much. But I wouldn't be surprised if this is all a strategy for Ye and he's going to sell these full masks with Adidas or The Gap or whoever he's working with. If this starts a trend of people who normally wouldn't wear face masks to go all the way with it like Ye does, I think it's a win-win for public health and for my eyes, to be honest. Let's talk about the sneakers app. <sighs> sneakers app. I want to love you, but I can't. I want to hate you, but I can't. I'm mostly just indifferent at this point, but that doesn't mean you should stop trying to make a better experience for your customers. And putting up a post explaining how exclusive access works, ain't it, Jack? 
See, if you haven't been on the app, and quite honestly, why would you be on the app when it's not 7 a.m. Pacific time on release day? Nike basically dropped a press release telling its customers what to do and not to do in order to secure those elusive invites that let you get a pair of hype releases a few days or even weeks before the official drop date. It's not really that long of a read, but it's not really telling us anything new. See, we already knew that Nike was tracking our every move on the app. Like, Duh, of course Nike has a log of your sneakers activity. It knows where you are and if you're within range of one of their stores in order to be eligible for a sneakers pass. It knows if you're looking at a pair of dunks that you want at 3 a.m. in the morning. It knows whether or not you watch their Snapchat-like stories about what the kids are wearing or their features on local sneakerheads who show off their grails. It knows that you constantly check your inbox just in case you missed an exclusive access invite. It knows that you watched that entire Marcus Jordan video when he was hyping up the Air Jordan 11 Jubilee this past holiday season? That's actually how co-writer got his Jubilees. He fired up the live stream, put it on mute, wrote that week's episode of Hard Pass, and glanced occasionally just in case a notification popped up. Sure enough, a few days later, he got the exclusive access to the 11s. It doesn't mean everybody else that did the same thing got the same invite. It just goes into the algorithm, and if it's your time, well, it's your time. I think this post was more about encouraging people to never leave the app and discouraging people from using bots and whatnot, but yeah, good luck with that. If bots can be programmed to flood the draw, they can be programmed to watch live streams and not be super obvious about tapping on everything in sight. Nike said that there is an update on the way that would be a fix for the exclusive access model. Like, I want to believe that, but I also don't want to be forced to look at sneakers all day long, staring at Shu Hefner's video feature because A, his collection puts all of us to shame, and B, I got to do. I'm gonna have to see this fix for myself to believe that it will actually be the thing that gets us back on track, or more accurately, gets us on a more equitable track for once, but I have my doubts that this will be the solution that Nike is hoping it will be, so we'll finally shut up. Now, there are things we as a community should really pump the brakes on, but, more on that a little bit later. Yo, if you watch any of my videos, you know I have the large drop phone boxes all over the studio. Sometimes I use them to put the shoes in there, and sometimes I use them to put the box in there. But Container Store just made things a lot easier. Well, Container Store, they listened, and they're introducing the XL drop front shoe boxes. One, they can fit up to a size 16. Two, the handles, they're a lot more durable. And three, you can get them in clear or in black, and the black gives you UV protection. Here's an example of the size difference. This is a large, door doesn't close. If you get the XL, Shoe fits right inside, perfect. For those looking to upgrade or just add to your collection, the XL is available exclusively at the Container Store. All right, it's the heat check, where we bring you everything that's dropping this week. Let's start things off with some quick mentions of the non-Space Jam kicks that will be available. Barring surprise drops or collabs that don't get announced until a day or two before launch, there's not a lot out there if you're not into the movie. Even the other brands have basically conceded this week to a new legacy. We have the Nike ISPA Flow 2020 in pure platinum on the 13th for 180. Nike's commitment to experimental silhouettes continues, but with a new colorway that might be its least experimental in pure platinum. So weird, but not too weird. Got it? We have the women's Nike Air Max 90 Legacy on the 14th for 140. The patchwork nature of the upper might give you the impression that this is another ISPA shoe, but this women's exclusive is aiming for something else. Like what would happen if you had the materials to make an Air Max 90, but none of them matched? We have the Nike KD14 Multicolor on the 16th for 150. I mean, it's technically multicolor because there are multiple colors on the shoe, but are there enough to justify the name? Not really. I must say, I thought these were Space Jam themed and that maybe KD has a cameo in the movie, but then I remembered the kid's classic Thunderstruck and thought KD's too big time for Space Jam. We have the Jordan 1 Electro Orange on the 17th for 170. Oh, we're not calling these Shattered Backboard 4.0s. Thank you, sneaker gods. You all did my mentals a solid here. And now for the Space Jam, a new legacy portion of the heat check. We have the Converse Chuck 70 on the 16th for 120 and the All-Star on the 16th for 70. It's far from the first time we've seen Bugs and the crew in Chucks, but it's always fun whenever Nike can integrate Converse to their wider collaborations. If LeBron were playing in the finals, we would probably see these as part of the movie's promotion. We have the Air Force One computer chip on the 16th for 120 and the Toon Squad on the 16th for 120. The computer chip is a little too plain for my taste, although the lenticular materials used in one of the side panels is a nice touch. Feels like most people are going to want the Toon Squad pair that features Lola and Bugs overlapping the swoosh. 
We have the kids, LeBron, 18 low, Lola Bunny on the 16th for 130. The 18 low, Bugs versus Marvin on the 16th for 160. The 18 low, Sylvester and Tweety on the 16th for 160. The Nike LeBron 18 low gets all the attention this week with new colorways that highlight the eternal rivalries of Looney Tunes. I'm partial to the Bugs versus Marvin pair because their ties to Nike go all the way back to the early 90s, even before the original Space Jam. And then the pick of the week is the Xbox Space Jam Nike LeBron 18 Low Wally Coyote versus Roadrunner. That's on the 15th for 220. The price increase is due to inclusion of a custom Xbox controller that features the frenemies Wally Coyote and Roadrunner. Now, if you just want the shoes, there's a separate release on the 16th that's priced the same as the other LeBron 18 Lows. But we're sticking with this one and playing that free Space Jam brawler on Xbox Game Pass. Pro tip always use the granny card. And now for a heat check on PJ Tucker, the NBA's reigning, defending, and undisputed sneaker king he's been on a roll since well he's been on a roll for quite a while now after starting the season out in houston on the team that was falling apart he is now on the league's biggest stage playing a critical role for the eastern conference champion milwaukee bucks and he's making the most of that time in the spotlight during the east finals he turned heads with hidden gems like the nike hyper dunk 2010 grinch and the infamous air jordan 4 eminem encore we normally don't celebrate conference championships around here in la because as the late kobe bryant used to say job's not finished but we can take the time to appreciate PJ actually wearing his super rare J's to celebrate that accomplishment. But he wasn't done making news as he also announced a sneaker collaboration with Dolce & Gabbana, dropping two colorways of the Miami sneaker in beige and bright ass orange. This is his second collab with the high-end brand. A few years back, he teamed up with the Giuseppe Zanotti that turned heads. Not surprisingly, the shoes and the news itself has gotten a mixed reaction online, ranging from the $7.95 price tag to the design to the shock non sneakerheads get whenever PJ gets a mention. While I understand and to a certain extent agree with the consternation behind the price and the look and the conversations people are having about the brand, what I'm kinda over is the same old comments whenever PJ makes news on the sneaker internet. It's a mix of damn, must be nice, and I wish I was on his level comments, and the snarky, not bad for a role player, and why is somebody who can't even score 10 points a game always getting feature type of replies? It's getting old. People come up with new material. PJ Tucker doesn't deserve this attention comments or like LeBron couldn't do that arguments in Michael Jordan posts that have nothing to do with LeBron. We get it. PJ lives in the minds of hater-ass, hater sneakerheads. Why can't we sit back and applaud the fact that a player who was a second-round pick in the same year as Rajon Rondo and Kyle Lowry is still going? That doesn't do it for you? How about the fact that he played in the D-League and then in Europe for years before getting another chance to play in the NBA, which he chronicles through Nike Kobe 6 PEs that represents the teams he's played for? That's not enough? What about building a name for himself through sneakers, rocking everything from heat even the most casual sneakerhead would recognize to obscure player exclusive that I'm sure some older Jordan brand athletes are scratching their heads about? A few months ago, Carmelo Anthony was one such Jordan guy who tweeted his disbelief that PJ got his hands and feet on a pair of Air Jordan 5s made exclusively for his NASL club. Uh, side note, because I know some of you are wondering, according to Wikipedia, the NASL was a short-lived American second-tier soccer league and Melo bought a team based in Puerto Rico. And that's not even the end of the story because Melo let PJ have it at the end of his wine podcast. Uh, second side note, yes, Melo has a wine podcast. PJ, give me my damn sneakers back. Like, what? Give me my sneakers back, bro. You, <laughs> he looked, CJ, he looked me in my face and said, <laughs> he said, you can't, like, no, I got one pair. You can't have them. I said, Melo, I'm going to find them shoes. Nice. I told him, I said, I'm going to find these shoes. If PJ Tucker was willing to hustle and grind in obscurity away from the NBA for as long as he did just to get a second chance, you better believe he was going to find a pair of J's made from Melo's soccer team. If I were Jordan Brand athlete Kiefer Ravenna, I'd watch my back because PJ might break out with the Air Jordan 4 Manila before he does in the game. Anyways, we're recording this as the NBA Finals is going on, so we're not sure what PJ will be rocking throughout the series, although we did catch him in mags before game two. Not to mention the slight troll of wearing the Nike Kobe 1 Pro Troll PE made for his former teammate in Phoenix, Devin Booker. So here are your flowers, PJ. Win or lose in the Finals, you earned it. We're giving him Tim Air Jordan 3 Oregon pit crew out of 10 Nike Kobe 4 Pro Troll Drew Wades. He is who we thought Nick Young was going to be. It's time for this week's Hard Pass, where we take a look at something in the culture that just needs to go. Like Vulture declaring in a tweet that Scarlett Johansson and the guy who isn't Michael Che on SNL's Weekend Update, America's royal family. Like, this is an obvious troll by Vulture's social team, and it got them the response that they wanted. 
The replies were full of gifts of Beyonce and Jay-Z's family and the Obamas and so on. Like, literally Meghan and Harry live here now. Vulture really should have picked a less troll-worthy couple than Black Widow and the dude who got thrown in the air by Braun Strowman during a WrestleMania Battle Royal to give that title to. Like, maybe try Jeopardy host Aaron Rodgers and actress Shailene Woodley or host of The Cube Dwayne Wade and actress Gabrielle Union. Seems like game show host and actress combos are the thing these days. I think we can co-sign either one of those. Not co-writer's dream girl from Lost in Translation and the one white guy with the speaking part in Coming to America sequel. Anyways, this week's hard pass goes to overhyping ourselves up for no good reason. This past week, we got our first look at the new Nintendo Switch. After nearly a year of reports from reputable news sources like Bloomberg and rampant speculation on video game Twitter that a 4K update with faster hardware was on the way, the announcement of the new Switch OLED dropped like a ton of bricks. It's basically the same console we've been enjoying for the past four and a half years, but now it has a slightly larger OLED screen, improved audio, a more reliable kickstand, and well, that's about it. Was it the update that I wanted it to be? as I hear my OG Switch's exhaust getting louder by the minute? No, and that's fine. Really, it's fine. While the hardcore gaming community was hoping that this would be a half-step upgrade like the Xbox One X or the PS4 Pro from the last generation, this is more like Nintendo being, well, Nintendo. Think about it. The Switch launched in 2017, and despite being woefully underpowered compared to even the base PS4 and Xbox One, it has already outsold all combined versions of the Xbox One and is fast approaching the PS4 in lifetime sales. So what does Nintendo do to keep the ball rolling in 2019? Update the system so it's on the same power level as its competition? Nope. They released the Switch Lite with the same guts at an even lower price point that sold even more units. During the peak of the pandemic last year, Switch Lights were damn near impossible to find in stores. If there's one thing that Nintendo is very good at, besides the whole thing about creating experiences and software that no other company can touch, it's making money off of us with the same sh and they don't have incentives to change because the loud voices on social media and the message boards are unhappy. Why? Well, because Nintendo knows most of those voices who yell the loudest will be there day one to buy the OLED Switch. Just like the Game Boy days when there was the Game Boy, the Game Boy Pocket, Game Boy Light, and Game Boy Colors. That's three revisions if you're counting. Then there was the Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Advance SP, GBA SP with the better backlight, and then the GBA Micro, another three. DS, DS Lite, DSi, and DSi XL, another three. 3DS, 3DS XL, 2DS, new 3DS, new 3DS XL, new 2DS XL, another, th I mean, five. Sorry, thought I was DJ Khaled there for a second. Nintendo is kind of like Nike in that way. We sneakerheads whine and complain that sneaker culture is dying for a number of reasons. But all Nintendo, I mean, all Nike has to do is give us a new colorway of the Air Jordan 1 that's hot or drop an OG and we're right back to taking L's on Saturday morning. We don't follow through on our threats to quit. And even if we do resist, we can't keep up the same energy because when too much cool stuff drops, we get the sneaker FOMO bad. Now, you're probably saying, oh, look at Jop, caping for Nintendo like he's got a brand deal. First of all, how dare you? Second of all, I would love to get a brand deal with Nintendo. Somebody over there give me a call. I have the best Mario impression, you've seen it. But it's not about supporting the big multi-billion dollar corporation. It's about knowing the game that they play and how we perpetuate it through our outrage and our dollars. We can't keep wasting our time and energy getting mad at Nintendo and Nike for not giving us what we want and then turning around and buying the things we didn't want. Just move on and wait for the next thing. There's no need to fire off angry tweets and harass people who are either excited for this new switch or undefended by its presence. If it ain't for you, it doesn't mean it ain't for somebody else. It's like when people get themselves all worked up during these MCU TV shows and then they act like they were betrayed when their theories don't come to fruition. Like, remember when WandaVision was supposed to give us Mephisto and the X-Men and the Fantastic Four or how the Power Broker and Falcon and the Winter Soldier was gonna give us the mutants or whatever? Like. It's cool to speculate and to hope something comes to pass, but if it doesn't happen and you get angry at them because they couldn't meet your expectations, that's kinda on you. Like if the Loki finale just ends and there's no connection to the new Doctor Strange or Spider-Man movies, it's okay. We don't need to see and that leads to and It would be cool if it does happen, but after two MCU shows so far, I think we know what the precedent is. I think we have a good idea of what's going to happen. Rest assured, I believe those reports that a 4K switch is on the way. 
Why? Because of course Nintendo was going to make a 4K Switch or release a whole new console that will improve upon the Switch blueprint in every way. It just isn't going to be right now. There's the whole interview where Doug Bowser, Nintendo of America's big boss in both name and title really, says in late 2020 that they were just halfway through the Switch's life cycle. And there's the reality that there is a chip shortage right now. And whatever parts that would be used to power a hypothetical Switch Pro is not something that can easily be acquired. Maybe in 2022 when the supply chains are a little more sorted out or more likely in 2023 when it will have been two years since the OLED switch, of course in two years we could just get a third revision and the Joy-Cons are fixed and that'll be fine too. I'm never in a rush to spend $300 or more on a new console no matter how pretty they look and you shouldn't be either. All that being said, Co-Rider is absolutely going to buy a Nintendo Switch OLED. He's the guy who bought 10 Nintendo DS and 3DS systems because he can't help himself whenever a gold Zelda one pops up. But here we are. And that's going to do it for the show. Thank you guys for watching Hard Pass. I'm Jacques Slade. I'll see you next week, but not before I show you the attitude you need to have when you take an L on sneakers. Just bounce right back, baby. I'll see you next week. Peace.